what's up everyone and welcome to week what is this week eight of the what's your why series and man this episode here <laughs> today's episode features uh none other than minister dave ebert of um the gifts for glorious ministries he's actually a ordained minister um in the assemblies of god church and man this brother here he has a phenomenal ministry um now he is a jokester he is he i would say he's a comedian but he does improv comedy and he mixes that with ministry which is awesome you'll hear that the entire testimony you'll hear everything why he does it but this man of god is so awesome he's so phenomenal that you know one of the things that i love the most about this guy is that he has a great big heart um he was a pro wrestler at one time uh, yeah he was a pro wrestler mari if you're listening <laughs> my son mark he loves wrestling and <clears throat> man this man of god is just awesome man. he actually does some great work he helps sex trafficking victims you know find some sort of normalcy in life or helps them to get reacclimated into life and he does that because he wants to show them a positive example or a positive image of a man um, and that is so dope. It's so awesome in so many ways. You know, I pray that God continues to bless this man of God, continue to bless him and his wife, continue to bless this ministry and everything that he's doing. Check out his podcast, Gifts for Glory. Check out everything that he is doing. Support this brother for real because he is doing um, the work of an evangelist. He is doing great work. Um, and you'll see in this conversation, man, we talk about a lot of heavy and deep things. We go really deep because he has a testimony on suicide and I have a testimony as well on suicide and mental illness. And we, we talk about these things um, for the sole purpose of upbuilding the kingdom of God. So I am excited about today's episode. I pray that it blesses you. I pray that you guys open up your hearts, open up your minds, because today's episode is really different. Um, it's really going to, I don't say challenge or anything like that, but, you know, in the body of Christ, you know, we tend to have this um, this the stigma that you know we kind of gloss over mental health but now as of recently we're starting to see more people um actually come to the aid of um people or individuals who are suffering with mental illnesses um and we're actually taking more of a progressive step forward in mental health so today's episode is about that this is not the last time you're going to see these pastors on the show because I promise you, man, I have some ideas in play that I really want to bring these guys back on to talk about some other things as well. So without further ado, please enjoy the, uh, the um, conversation. Sorry, get tongue tied. Please enjoy the uh, conversation between me and Minister Dave Ebert here on One Faith Radio. So you ready to jump into it? Yeah, let's do it. I'm excited. Cool. I'm, I'm happy to be here, man. Thank you. Dope, dope, man. Of course, of course. So, um, before we jump into the first question, you know, just tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what you do in ministry, um, aside from the, uh, of course, the, the improv comedy thing. But, you know, you can incorporate all that, too, because I feel like it's a part of you. Sure. Um, I uh, am a uh, credentialed minister in the uh, Assemblies of God. Uh, my wife and I have both uh, gone through uh, two levels of their uh, ministry courses, and uh, we're possibly going to pursue ordination, but uh, we'll see what the Lord does. Uh, we uh, ran the uh, kids' church program at our church, and uh, we're, uh, she's also into sign language. She does uh, ASL as a way to, uh, to minister by interpreting worship music and also uh, helping uh, people who maybe are, uh, are struggling with communication in the traditional sense. So she's looking for opportunities to do that. Um, we also uh, run Gifts of Glory, which is my uh, podcast. And uh, it's also the, kind of the umbrella under which uh, my improv and uh, the, uh, the Christian Improv Festival that we run, uh, mm. that all kind of falls under Gifts for Glory, uh, in, as well as a podcast. And we just want to focus on finding ways to, not only for us, but for other people to find ways to step into their gifts that God has given them as yeah. a way to take their talents, whether they have the one talent or they have the 10 talents, and take them out and multiply them uh, for uh, the glory of God and for the growth of the kingdom to bring more people in. Yeah. And so any uh, gift that people have, uh, we would love to uh, help them whatever way we can. Exactly. I love that. You know, I think that we're in a, uh, a very specific time where people are 
um, able to act on their gifts, you know, whether you have uh, um, any kind of gift, you know, it may be a little bit difficult given that we can't go outside, <laughs> but you know, <laughs> you can definitely put yourself on a camera and just start going crazy and do whatever you want. And it can go viral or, you know, can be shared by your mom and dad and that's it. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I mean, you know, we, we are in this season where everyone can use their gifts for any type of, um, for anything, you know, to upbuild the, the body of Christ. Um, my gift is of course, I'm a, um, a licensed ordained elder um, in the church of God in Christ. Um, um, and I preach, teach, all that good stuff. Um, I also have this podcast and radio show. So that's the way I'm using, utilizing my gifts. Um, and like you said, you, you're utilizing your gifts in a much, um, in, a, in, a, in a very interesting way that I think that is dope. I think that it's uh, very interesting. And to the listeners that are listening to the show, um, they're going to be, you know, intrigued about, you know, how you're, you know, pulling all this stuff together to build, you know, a, a great ministry. So um, the first question that I have for you is, uh, what, what is your why? Uh, my why is, um, and I know that uh, uh, you will ask me uh, about my full testimony later, but for many years I covered up depression using comedy and it was mm-hmm. something that the Lord has now turned into something redemptive. Mm-hmm. All that time that I developed a sensitivity to see what people needed and being able to respond in a way that lightens the situation or, you know, at least, at least like bring some levity to a moment. Mm-hmm. Um, not that I'm, I mean, I am a class clown, don't get me wrong, but when the moment calls for it, I have this instinct that God has developed in me that I kind of know what to say in mm-hmm. just instinctively that might, you know, break some of the tension. Yeah. And um, so I'd used to, comedy as a, a way to kind of hide who I was. I now use it to, as a way to reveal who he is. Wow. And uh, one of my favorite comedians is Michael Jr. I'm sure you've heard of Michael Jr. Mm-mm. Oh, you have it? Oh, oh. no, you're talking about, oh, you, I know you're talking about, he's a Christian comedian. Right, Christian yeah, comedian. Yeah, 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 I got you. Uh, he gave an interview where he said, laughter is the tangible evidence of hope. Mm. And when I heard that, it was like, yes, I can do this and have purpose. It just like was a moment of affirmation for me. So my purpose is to bring light to a very dark world. And, and when people ask, well, why are you clean? Why do you not curse? Why do you not make innuendo? I could say, well, it's because I serve a higher purpose Uh, because my comedy is not all biblical jokes when appropriate. I can infuse some biblical stuff in there, Mm -hmm. but I try to stay away from the Bible because in, especially in improv, you could go too far and become a heretic and offend yeah. people very easily. Yeah. So we want to respect the word. Um, and we just want to bring anything that passes the Philippians four, eight test, mm. what is pure, lovely and good and of God and God honoring, you know, those kind of things is what we want to bring to the stage. Yeah. And uh, so we just, we want to bring joy. Um, my team, my wife, myself, we want to bring joy and distract from what the world keeps telling us is wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. Um, so, and this is kind of one off question to what you were saying. Um, now you're a part of assemblies of God. So that's a Pentecostal church. Mm-hmm. Um, how have you received any like backlash for, for doing comedy uh, or Christian comedy in that manner? No, um, for the most part, everybody's pretty supportive. Uh, yeah. There are people that don't get it, mm-hmm. but they haven't been like, oh, that's heresy. No, that's, you know, that's sacrilegious to make jokes in church. Right. Um, because I, when I've preached, I always open up with a joke because that helps calm me because the only time I'm ever nervous in front of people is if I'm bringing the word of God. Yeah. That's the only time I get nervous. And so I tell a joke to kind of, get them laughing, mm-hmm. break the ice for me personally so I can step in comfortably and uh, share whatever I'm sharing, yeah. uh, whatever the Lord's given me. So um, it's, in my experience, the only people that have questioned it have been non-believers that will question like, mm-hmm. how can you be funny and clean? They're, they're, you're so limiting on your, you're limiting your creativity so much. And I respond said, well, I believe in a creator that created everything right. and i'm in his image so if he can create everything with just a word mm-hmm. then why can't i on a smaller level on a smaller stage do just the same since i'm in his, in his image right that's interesting that's interesting and i love that you know it's 
it's all about, you know, like you said, doing things for the glory of God, but at the same time, you know, being clean and doing things right. And I think that um, doing anything that resembles, um, I don't, I don't want to say secularism because that, I just feel that comedy is a part. I do feel that comedy can be a part of the ministry if you're, if you're really good at it. Right. You know, because there are a lot of comedians out here, you know, of course, your secular comedians, they know how to infuse their um, their beliefs um, and talk about the times and talk about everything that's going on with the comedy. And you learn something from it. And at the same time, you're, you're laughing. And I feel like, you know, there is a, a semblance with that in ministry, because mm -hmm. when you're preaching, you know, you can be reading some story in the Bible and it to you or to me, it can have some type of. Um, comedic undertone and you like you're laughing about it because you know you, you find the funny in it and somebody listening and like oh, that's not really that funny <laughs> but but, <laughs> but you know you you find it and and somehow in some way you weave it into your sermons and people laugh because I've seen many people preachers do it I do it sometimes mm -hmm. I, I find myself you know cracking a joke or two and my wife she gets on me sometimes because she says I laugh too much at my own jokes <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I mean if for me I'm, I'm a lot like you like when I did public speaking or whenever I have any public speaking events I would always crack a joke first like you because I feel like once I get the joke out and everybody start laughing and they're good then it calms me down I'm like okay everyone is good so <laughs> I broke the ice I can go ahead and do what I need to do and so with ministry it's a little bit different for me um, I'll, I'll weave it in there somehow some way um, in some, you know, ridiculous form <laughs> that is kind of clever. But, you know, I don't want to take away from the main goal of preaching, which is, you know, of course, to uh, point people to Christ. Mm -hmm. So I love that. I love that. So um, and there's something that um, I've found. I don't know if there's science to back it up, but something that I've found in my experience is that when you get a group of people together, Mm -hmm. you, if you get 500 people together and they're all strangers, don't know each other from Adam, mm -hmm. but suddenly they laugh together, yeah. they've admitted something about themselves. They've become vulnerable, which means that they're ready to receive a message. That's and they've also eliminated the lonely factor because since they've all admitted the same thing about themselves, they all no longer feel alone because right. it's like, oh, we have something in common. We thought that was funny. And it happens on this very spiritual subconscious level that when you get a group of people to laugh at something together that they're suddenly united and right. when they're united they're ready to receive any kind of message yeah. which is why i think humor is very powerful uh, as a setup tool um either if we come in and we open up for a speaker or if we come in perform and then include a testimony as part of our show it that laughter is going to open hearts and uh, kind of bring down those walls of Jericho mm -hmm. as they shout with laughter and uh, they'll be ready to receive. And also, it'll also, it gives people, like you said, it, it breaks people out of their comfort zone and gives them that level of, um, of vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And it also just allows them to just open up and say, okay, I see myself in this person. Mm -hmm. I can actually trust them. And I can listen to them. And I think that that's important too, because, you know, anyone can get up and, and say anything and it's just, not great but right. if you can connect with some that person on some talk on some uh, on some type of level sorry i get tongue-tied and all that stuff and i get excited i'm talking but if you can connect with them on some level you know you're able to listen to them to trust them more um and to let your guard down just a little bit so that you can receive what they're saying so that's dope all right so let's jump into your testimony because i want to hear it um what is your testimony for salvation um, and that kind of goes off of your why, I'm pretty sure, because you talked about it a little bit in your why. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so my testimony, and it depends on your theology. Um, some people would say, well, once saved, always saved. So when I accepted the Lord in sixth grade at a summer camp, that I was good and I was saved. But I definitely walked away. I said a little mm -hmm. prayer when I was in sixth grade. And uh, I, I remember walking up the gravel driveway, going to our cabins. And you know, I said, the little Jesus coming to my heart. And unfortunately, I was in a church that didn't know how to disciple. They didn't know how to build uh, kids up. And I don't say that as a negative. It's just a, a matter that of fact. how it is, yeah. Yeah. And so I was a kid. I was supposed to come in and go to Sunday school, get the little lesson, and then be good. But unfortunately, I was not discipled. And... I accepted Christ. I went to summer camps, but 
I didn't really pursue a true relationship with the Lord. Mm. And so high school hits, you know, I'm tra- chasing girls like any other red blooded guy would. Right. And uh, unfortunately um, I kept striking out because I was the nice guy and I was always trying to be the funny, nice guy. Like, Hey, I'm really cool. But right. I was also not athletic. I was on the football team, but I sat the bench. I really didn't have anything to quote unquote offer the girls. Right. right. So I kept striking out in uh, one hit me really hard. And I remember, I don't, I can't give you the date, but I remember the night where it went from flirting and like borderline uh, depression into a full blown, just like, I just felt myself dive into the darkness. Wow. And from my junior year, our early junior year of high school, uh, really until I was about 33, 32, 33 years old, I was in a constant struggle back and forth of, do I have enough value to justify being alive? I wrestled mm. with suicidal thoughts constantly. Wow. Um, and um, yeah, I don't know how long we have on the show, so I'll just go and you can cut what, out whatever piece you want. Yeah. Um, but there were, there were times when I was like really on the point of, of ending it. I okay. really said, you know, there are times I'd say, God, if you don't want me to do it, give me a reason. Mm. Um, one night in particular, I was uh, working an overnight job and I was driving home at uh, uh, it's about three or four in the morning. And I came to this cliff because I was living in West Virginia mm-hmm. and there's uh, a lot of sharp curves on mountains. Mm-hmm. And I was in my truck. It was late. I was by myself and the road curves sharp right so if i drove straight i'd go right off a cliff down into this ravine and it'd be done yeah so that's where i said god prove to me that you're there that you don't want me to do this and it was so weird because you know you think like if you watch a pure flicks movie you know the sky opens up the angels come and you, know, you get this amazing moment yeah but as lonely and as dark as i felt it felt like God was like even more quiet than normal. Mm. And uh, he, um, he just like, I, he doesn't do it, but it felt like he pulled even further away. Mm. And so what he was doing was sacrificing himself because he knew that I would get mad because he didn't respond. Mm. And I went home mad, but I went home. I went yeah. home cursing and like really mad. God, why did you show up? And he did what he knew I needed, and that was uh, to be quiet and make me wow. angry so I'd go home. And it was literally wow. God had laid himself down to absorb the barbs that I would shoot at him because mm. he knew that's what I needed so I'd go home and live. Um, and throughout my adult life, I used pro wrestling and uh, acting as ways to justify uh my existence, if I was able to entertain in a wrestling ring or entertain in a, a play or something and people would affirm me as a great actor or a great performer, then I could justify not yeah. committing suicide. It's like, okay, I've offered value this week. I can live one more week. Mm. And so I live like that for a better part of my life is straining to find reasons to justify my life mm-hmm. because I was in this dark place and some people that don't understand depression will, will ask questions like, well, why didn't you seek help? Well, hard. for the most, it's hard. When, when you feel like you're a burden for even being alive, you don't want to burden other people by asking for help. Like, hey, I'm depressed. Can you come around me? Uh, there is a darkness. It's just this self-fulfilling thing. And also the one time I did ask for help, I uh, unfortunately was referred to a bad doctor because I went into one session you know, to talk about my depression, I, I knew it was wrong. I knew that I was struggling and I knew I needed help. So I show up to this, uh, uh, this doctor that's supposed to hear me out and help me. Mm-hmm. And he asked me like 10 questions, you know, what do you do for fun? What do you do for enjoyment? Uh, what makes you happy? And so I listed a few things and he's like, well, how often do you get to do these things? So I said, well, you know, a couple times a week or once a week or a couple times a month uh, on different things. And he goes, see, look at this list. You really don't have a reason to be upset. You, have, you don't have a reason to be depressed. Hmm. And I was like, I know that's why I'm here. Right. I, I don't need you to 
remind me. I need you to help me take steps to get out of it. Right. So I felt even further let down because the one time we really asked for help, I was like, I was reminded that you're not supposed to be there. Mm. And this whole time that I'm struggling, I'm not with God. I've you know, sworn him off. I've cursed at him every time something goes wrong. Like, God, just leave me alone. Stay out of my life and let me do what I want. Yeah. And, and I was, the more I got mad at God, the deeper I felt. And uh, it led to me to rush into a marriage. I got uh, married in August of 2006. Mm. And we filed for divorce uh, the day after Christmas that same year. Wow. Um, I wasn't ready for marriage. I, w- I fell deeply in love, but ignored all sorts of red flags because she had just gotten out of, di- out of a, a divorce. Mm. So she was literally still healing from, our first, from her first marriage. We got married and divorced within four months. And there was where the enemy really sunk his teeth in. He's like, see, somebody promised to love you for the rest of their lives. And they couldn't mm. last a quarter of a year. Wow. So, I mean, it, it got deep, and 2012 was the year where I hit a pinnacle. Hmm. Um, as I was you know, wrestling, I was living in a one-bedroom apartment, and I was um, working at kind of a dead-end part-time job in radio. I was uh, a part-time board operator uh, at an AM uh, radio station, so not 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 exactly a, a illustrious career going on. <laughs> right. Um, and that radio station had originally hired me for their FM side, which is a 100,000 watt FM station that covered West Virginia. Mm-hmm. And I got demoted within the first week because yeah. a lady had come in that the general manager liked a little bit better. So he's like, I like what you do, so I'm gonna put you on the AM station. So the funny side note about that, the God thing about that is this AM station is a solid gospel station. Wow. So I'm sitting there every day disappointed but i'm also being fed without realizing it because i'm hearing these old timey southern baptist pastors uh the solid gospel music which isn't my cup of tea but i was still getting fed because these seeds were still getting planted Mm -hmm. and so it was a god thing even though it was you know it was an emotion um so all this is happening i'm building to this climax and i explained it that i was literally at the peak of a mountain down the left side, I take my life. Mm. Down the right side, I give my life. Mm. And finally, uh, as we get through the holidays of 2012 into 2013, I'm walking to work one day. And I lived in a neighborhood that had a very low population, very low foot traffic on a Saturday morning because we're right next to the courthouse. Yet this Bible school had two kids out there passing out Bible tracts. And for those that don't know, a Bible tract is basically like a small comic book that gives the gospel message with uh, yeah. some illustrations. Mm-hmm. And you know, I was here, I was there at that climax of either taking or giving my life. And then God just sent these two kids for no other reason than a God appointment to be there and offer to pray for me. I blew them off because I was I was, I was late to work, and I said, "Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. I pray, I'm good." But I took the Bible tract and. When I got home that evening, I was like, okay, God, I get it. And that's when I started uh, reading the Word, and Mm. I really started pursuing the Lord for the first time ever. And within six weeks, I had left my dead-end job and tiny apartment, and I had moved in with my sister in the suburbs of Chicago to pursue a life and ministry in performance and comedy. Wow. That's amazing, man. It's, it's so, um, it's, I don't, I don't, I don't want to say refreshing, <laughs> but that's like the first word that came to my mind because it's like, I, I symbolize or I relate to your story in a little, in a little bit because, you know, a lot of times people don't like to talk about their, um, their stories where, where, the, where they dealt with suicide and dealt with depression um, on a deep level. Um, especially in the church, like we, it's kind of like taboo. We don't even talking about suicide and stuff like that. But I feel like in the church, we need to talk about these things even more mm-hmm. because there are people that are really battling this stuff right now. Um, and when I say I symbolize or I um, relate to your story so much, it's because I, I too dealt with 
um, having suicidal thoughts, going through um, things where I wanted to just end it all myself. Um, I, just a quick little story about me. Um, so my mom was diagnosed with cancer when I was eight years old. Um, wow. That's when I initially got saved. And I was like, okay, I'm going to get saved at eight. Because my mom was, at the time, she was given two to three years to live. And so I was like, well, if she's going to die anytime soon, at least I get saved and she knows that I'm saved. She knows I'm all right. Mm -hmm. So didn't know anything about God then, but I got saved. Um, The Lord healed her from cancer um, to God the glory. But um, let's fast forward maybe eight years later. um, You know, I'm, I I won't say I walked away completely from God, but, you know, I was a hypocrite. You know, I was, I was in the church. I did a lot of things. I was playing the drums and part of the choir step team, all that good stuff. But, you know, I still did one thing because I wanted to be me. Um, Then when we went off to when I went off to college, um, a lot of things had transpired. My best friend passed um, suddenly. um, And then I moved back home because my mom had um, her cancer came back. um, And this time it was in, in the form of a brain tumor. Um, that eventually paralyzed her um, and it just put a lot of strain and stress on my family Um, and so we all ended up becoming full-time caretakers for her Um, and if anyone that's out there that has been a caretaker for their loved one they know how hard it is because um, you have they you're their only hope you're their only dependent like if they got to use the bathroom they have to ask you to pick them up and take them to the bathroom if they have or if they can't do if they can't even get out of bed then you have to change their diaper and stuff like that and so it was doing those things from mom that really it it took a toll because at the time I was still in school I was still in college Mm -hmm. I was in college full-time had two full-time jobs because I was helping my family keep the bills afloat um and I was dating my wife at the time Uh, my wife who my wife now I was dating her at the time and we were um you know, going through a little bit of a rough patch and then we were talking to, and then everything that's going on with school, I was a full-time student, but I was kind of failing and everything. And so I just felt like a failure. And it was just like, you know what, God, I'm just done with everything because it's just a lot of pressure. You know, you're in school full-time, you're, you have two full-time jobs, you come home at night and there will be literally, I would come home from work at 12 o'clock midnight and have to stay up with my mom all the way till about five o'clock in the morning get some kind of sleep, turn around, wake up and go to the next job um, Mm. at six o'clock in the morning and then leave that job, go to school. And it was a lot of pressure, it was a lot of stress. And I remember just one night, I was just tired of it all. Uh, Still grieving the loss of my best friend um, and just really hurt in that moment. And I just really remember laying down on the floor and was just saying, God, I'm ready to just, I'm ready to just end it all. I just want to just end it all. And I remember you know, mm. driving home from work, like there'll be times I'll be driving home from work and I was just like, I was just stare in the oncoming traffic and be like, I, you know what? My life doesn't matter. Nothing matters anymore. I wouldn't mind just driving off into the oncoming traffic and just ended it all. Or I would just look at a tree and be like, man, that tree looks like that's the one. I'm just going to mm. go full tilt. Or if I see the guardrails, I, I can go into the guardrail and nobody would care. And it was in those moments, it's like, Every time, and I was still, I was still a Christian. I was still saved. I was still in the church, and I was, you know, still doing these things. But at the same time, I was, I was dealing with this stuff heavily, um, and it was hard to really overcome that. But the, that night, going back to that night when I just wanted to end it all, and I just told God that I'm just done, literally. And it kind of sounds like that that, that pure flicks moment where the heavens opens up and God himself just reveals and says, TJ, you're fine. But that's not, it wasn't the case. It was just, you know, I heard a small, still voice that just said, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Get up. It's going to be all right. And when I heard that voice and when I heard that, that literally changed my life immediately because that's when I knew that I had purpose. That's when I knew that my life mattered in that moment. Um, and for anyone that's listening and has dealt with um, suicidal thoughts or dealing with mental illness or dealing with depression in any type of form, you know, we, me and my brother Dave, we are living testimonies that, you know, you can come out of it. You can come through it. Um, you, your Amen. life matters. You know, you Amen. matter to all of us. Um, it may not look like it right now. It may not seem like it right now, but you know, you matter. Um, if I would have ended it then, 
I would not be in the position that I am today. Like, we wouldn't be talking on the phone if right. we decided to go through with it. And I think that is paramount in and of itself. Um, I'm married. Me and my wife, we have two kids, and we just found out that we're expecting another one. Oh, congratulations. So, thank you. <laughs> and it's like, you know, God just continues to bless us and bless us. And we would never, I would never see these blessings if I would have ended it then, if I would have just sat in that. And it's so funny because there was a song that um, that would play. It was, it was funny. It was like literally every single time I was thinking about doing something crazy, this song would play on the radio. <laughs> uh, it was um, Norman Hutchins, um, I Know You're Gonna Make It. And every wow. single time I would just, you know, think that it's, it's a rap. Like, I'm just tired. This song would play. Whenever I'd be staring at the oncoming traffic, that song would play. Whenever I'd be staring, you know, at a guardrail going down the street, that song would play. And I was just like, and I just remember one day going to work and just crying, like, God, why, why am I going through all of this? It's like, why? And, it, and I just couldn't understand. And that song was playing. And it was, there's so many, there's so many God moments in that. And, and with you, I'm pretty sure you, you can, you know, there's God moments that mm -hmm. helped you along the way. And so for anyone listening, there are God moments that are going to help you along the way. There are God moments that he's going to step in and he's going to help you. But you have to live. You have to really seek, um, seek his face. And I know that sounds cliche, and I know that sounds like everyone says that all the time. But the only way to really get through depression is to um, look to the hills from which come with our help. We have to look to, towards God. Um, and, you know, of course, seek professional help um, and great professional help because, as you said, you know, <laughs> you had the bad doctor. I think I would have cussed him out. <laughs> but, <laughs> But at the same time, it's like, you know, you have to find someone who can relate. And I think right. that the church, um, I'm not trying to say that the church should be burdened by this, but it's something that the church should learn how to do. We should learn how to disciple people who are depressed. You need to learn how to disciple people who are having, who are battling mental illness issues. Because as I said, we all, we all deal with mental illness in some form of capacity. Um, but exactly. we have to really, we have to address it. It's just like uh, when you get sick with the flu or something like that. You know, you have to address it. You have to talk about these things. And these things are taboo in our, in our churches. I hate that. But yeah. I really feel that we're turning the tide. Um, there are a lot of young people, um, a lot of young preachers, um, to be exact, who are passionate about these topics, passionate about these things. And um, me and you, you know, what we do, our gifts, you know, we're passionate about these things because we want to see people live. We want to see people have a purposeful life. Um, and I, I get that from you. You know, I get that from your ministry with what you're doing you want to see people live you want to see people um enjoy life um i i was a class clown i was the guy that would just keep everybody cracking up laughing and everything like that but i i did that to keep from crying right <laughs> or or i was a, i mean i'm a little fat now but i, I was a fat <laughs> kid growing up and when people pick on me you know i learned how to just jab back that's how i would survive yeah. But, you know, even as you get older, you kind of do the same thing. You know, when people make fun of you, you kind of like, you know what? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a defense mechanism. But now we're seeing it with your story. We're seeing how it's turned from a defense mechanism to actually an offensive mechanism that can be used to help upbuild the kingdom of God. It can be used to help encourage people to um, move forward in the things of God. So um, I yeah. love it. I love it. I love and it. This is something, if I could take uh, a moment, um, yeah. every time I give an interview and I'm able to share my testimony, I always give my email address to anybody listening that may be going through something similar. Mm -hmm. um, here's my promise to you. I'm not going to preach at you. I'm not going to drown you in scripture. Uh, I just want to listen. And if anybody is going through that, uh, please email me. It comes directly to my phone. This email address will never go away as long as I have breath. Uh, it's uh, Dave at gifts for glory dot com. Dave at gifts the number four glory dot com. That's not a mailing list email. I'm not going to like keep you on some list, right. but that's the best way that you can reach me because um, it comes directly to my phone. If you have something that you want to say or share that you need to get off your chest, I would love to be there to listen. And uh, and I'm not going to preach at you. I'm just going to listen because I know that. I know for a fact that no two depressions are the same. So there's no blanket yeah. answers. Yeah. There's no blanket scripture that's going to fix everything. Right. But the honest thing is relationship and, and 
talking to somebody, especially somebody that's had that experience. So I want to make sure that everyone knows that my email address is always available if you are going through that. Um, and whether you're listening to this when it first comes out here in 2020 or you find the archives in 2027, uh, but if if the rapture has happened, I cannot promise I'll be here to get that email. <laughs> Me neither. <laughs> you definitely have to find God then. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, it, and you brought up you brought up the point that the church is still kind of on that cusp of taboo. But one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, after seeing God rain down fire and destroy these other prophets and these other men of uh, of heresy uh, of Baal, he was like, "Man, I just saw that victory, but I'm just lamenting of life. Just yeah. take me now, God." And God was like, "Hey, Elijah, take a nap. We're gonna give you some food. You're gonna be all right." <laughs> So depression, it, it's addressed in the Bible. Even Paul talked about, yeah. about lamenting a life. Yeah. So it's not a dirty subject. It, it's, a, it's a disease. It's a cancer. You don't walk up to somebody that says, man, I got a brain tumor. And like, well, if you just had enough, enough faith and you prayed it away, you'd be fine. <laughs> no, you go see a doctor and right. you pray, but you also take the proper steps. And if you're depressed, see the proper steps because you are worth it. Because yeah. God thought you were worth dying for, and you are in no position to disagree with that. Preach. Preach. <laughs> Boy, we can we about to take off. <laughs> Pass that off from plate. Right. <laughs> I definitely take it. But yeah, I, I love that because what like you said, people people need to understand that, you know, when people are going through something, you know, it's of course it's a ministry opportunity. It could be. But a lot of times, you know, we have to have the heart to just listen. Right. Um, people just want to be heard. They just want their voice to be heard. They just want to matter in that moment. And instead of trying to find a way to weave in God and a gospel in that moment, a lot of times you just have to sit there and listen mm -hmm. um, and hear their heart. Because a lot of times by listening and hearing their heart, the Holy Spirit will talk to you and tell you exactly what to do. Exactly. And you don't have to ignore the Holy Spirit, but, you know, the, there are times when, and I've, and I've had conversations with people as well, um, that were dealing with depression and, 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 and um, about to commit suicide, and the Holy Spirit literally just told me to shut up, just mm -hmm. listen. And honestly, that's what it takes. It just takes us to really just shut up, listen, let that person pour their heart out. And then when you find that opportunity, and either the Holy Spirit will tell you or you'll just see it. You know, when you find an opportunity to talk about the gospel, talk about Jesus, talk about how he can um, save, how he can change, how he can help help you in that moment. Not talking, to, don't talk about um, they're going to hell if they commit suicide or they're going to they're going to hell if they um, go through with any type of sin or they're sin bound. So they're definitely going to, that's just going to drive a person further off the cliff. Right. Like we have to have a heart for people. We have to understand that, you know, hey, everyone has their own battles that they're going through. Everyone has their own things. Sometimes people just need to listen. And right. um, a lot of men, um, I, we did a Bible, um, I won't say a Bible study, but we had a, a men's meeting. Uh, we hold one every Wednesday at my church uh, where we just talk to the men and we just, you know, it's an open space. We talk, we listen, um, we'll, 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 ha we'll share a, a Bible story or a passage in the scripture to kind of get people to talk about these things too. And we'll pray. Um, and that's what it's all about. You know, it's not about trying to, you know, come up with the greatest advice to give someone because in the moment you may not have the best advice, but it's just about listening. And once you listen to what these people are going through, listen to, the, to their stories, uh, it can point you specifically on how to pray for them and how to really uh, allow the Holy Spirit to intercede on their behalf. So I love it. I love it, man. This is good. This is some good stuff. And one thing I want to uh, tell everybody out there is if you know somebody that may be going through this, let me take this burden off of your shoulders. It is not your job to fix or heal them. It is not your job. It's not your responsibility. You are free of that burden because that burden falls on God and he's got big enough shoulders to do it. Yes, so it don't feel like you have to fix it. Just be there. Be present. You don't have to correct wrong thinking. Let them have diarrhea of the mouth as they just get stuff out let them get it out let them get it and, out and then have that relationship to say 
hey, I, I don't understand, but I'm here and I know that you have value and I love you. And I'm here through the, to the end of the age for you. So whatever you have to say, if you have to just have diarrhea of the mouth once a week for two hours, I'm here to listen and I'm here to hug you afterwards. Right. I love that. And that's, that's key. That's what we need. I, I wish that more preachers would adopt that because, you know, we, a lot of times we just, you know, we don't want to be around people. If you're just going to, you know, just beat yourself all the time, or, you know, I don't want to be around you. But, you know, we have to have that heart for people to yeah. let people be who they are. You know, everybody's not perfect. I mean, you know, there's a lot of preachers out here who definitely aren't perfect that put on a persona that they are. But we have to really, you know, let people be who they are um, and let God work on them. You know, right. we can we can minister and, and say all the right things and put the right things into place. But it really takes the Holy Spirit working in that person to change their heart, to change their life. Because just like my story, and yours, it wasn't until the Holy Spirit stepped in and showed right. us. That's when change started to happen. That's when change came. So exactly. Um. Man, that is great. <laughs> so, um, let's see. What, what do I want to ask you? So, when when were you called to ministry, and did you answer it right away? Uh, and if your answer is no, and you kind of did go into a little bit, uh, you know, why did you ignore the call, and what prompted you to eventually um, acquiesce or agree to your call? Sure. Um, I felt the call when I was really young, I was, it was probably early high school before I really got into my deep depression mm -hmm. because I'd grown up with an uncle who was in ministry. He was, uh, I actually looked quite a lot uh, like he did. Um, he was my mom's brother and people would call me little Curtis because I looked just like Curtis, her brother. Mm -hmm. And people would always be shocked when I said, Oh, Curtis is a minister now. He's preaching down in Tennessee. Uh, because they saw him grow up and he was anything but Christian. He was, uh, <laughs> you know, he was into drugs and women and whatever else, but he got into ministry. So I thought, wow, I want to be like my uncle in more ways than just looking like him. Right. So I felt like that was a, a seed planted. But uh, of course, my testimony is I walked away and I was not pursuing the Lord in any way, shape or form uh, for a majority of my life. But again, there's so many stories of him planting seeds or watering some seeds even though many of them were dormant for a couple of decades. Yeah. He knew what was coming. He knew that I'd come, come around and I would have a great, I would have a story to tell. Uh, unfortunately for my uncle, he went back to his old ways at one point, went to jail uh, for a couple of things that he got involved with. And that was when I was in college. And I, I kind of felt like, man, maybe I don't want to be a minister. Maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's all, made up right and so it was it was definitely hard for me to see my uncle go from this perfect pastor the really cool guy with with a thick tennessee accent up there preaching god it's like yeah this is what i want to do and um so i would say he has a part to do with that uh my my own personal choices of pursuing things and not pursuing god um is why i didn't answer the call until 2013 when god finally got a hold of me or i finally let god get a hold of me mm. he'd been tapping me on the shoulder the entire time i just kept shooing it away it, it was that still small voice that you talked about yeah where i would curse myself for not having the courage to commit suicide mm. but it was a still small voice just saying take one more breath yeah take one more step mm -hmm. live one more day and that was a still small voice and i was just i called it cowardness but Mm -hmm. again god just flips it on his ear man's wisdom is foolishness and yeah. uh so i delayed for a variety of reasons but those are kind of the, the big two is seeing my uncle fall and then seeing um my um my own choices lead to my depression yeah. and um you also mentioned something earlier about uh sometimes people in the church will assume that suicide equals the unforgivable sin. Mm -hmm. The Bible doesn't say that. Mm -hmm. There's nothing in the Bible that says suicide is unforgivable because God is not bound by time. He's not bound by the flesh. He can work miracles in those final milliseconds between the choice 
and the actual death. Mm. So there's nothing that says suicide is unforgivable. So mm. to use that as a tool to prevent suicide is not effective. It's actually very hurtful because mm. because those people who are in that moment are like, well, there's no hope for me, so why stick around? Mm. All right. All right. So I just want to toss that out there, but yeah. So those are the two big reasons: my depression and and I never really thought about it, but maybe seeing my uncle fall, who was my hero, fall in, in the way things ended for him, you know, that definitely played a, a role in how I, how I entered into uh, that season of depression. Yeah, I I agree. I think that when I look at um my story and where I came from and and everything like that, you know, my call. You know, I knew for a while, but I ignored it because I was just like, yeah, I am i don't want to be that typical preacher, that super deep guy. Every time you shake his hand, God bless you. How you doing, son? And I didn't want to be like that. Like, I just wanted to be me. I just wanted to be myself. And at the time I had lost a lot of weight. So I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm fine now. The girls were talking to me and all that good stuff. I was like, I really don't have time for God. But it was like once I got to the place where um, – really when all those kind of those chains of events kept happening it was, i felt that god was you know keeping me on the straight and narrow like hey i have a plan for you this is what i want you to do um and to be honest like i i knew i was called since i was a kid um and then i knew that i was called into the preaching ministry um when i was in college because i would have this dream that would just stay with me for for a number for well for a month, I had a the same the same this just, I had the same dream for a month, mm-hmm. and it just never went away. And I was just like, God, why am I having the same dream over and over and over again? And it was the call. It was the call that He was putting on my life. And then it wasn't until maybe like 2012 or 13 ish, uh, we were at a service, and I just literally saw God <laughs> hold up this sign over the pulpit and just said you should be here wow. <laughs> and I was just like okay I I got it <laughs> I got it now God let me go down for prayers <laughs> <laughs> so that's really what led me to get into uh, ministry and just kind of jump with two feet in because I always had one foot in one foot out I was like yeah no nah, yeah but now I'm just I'm two feet in this thing and I'm you know jumping in six well I'm six foot two so if I yeah. jumped into the six feet deep in, it really wouldn't do any justice. I would still have my head up above the water. <laughs> <laughs> but let's uh, jumping into the eight feet deep in there you go. Uh, with this thing. And I just love it. I mean, I love ministry. I love um, being able to pour into people. I love being um, able to um, preach and teach the gospel. Um, honestly, um, I've, I've said this numerous times. My preaching, I feel that my preaching is in vain if I can't connect with someone um, on that level when I'm preaching to them. And that's mm-hmm. honest to God truth. Uh, when I'm preaching, I feel the connections. I feel people. Um, I, I, that may sound strange to some people or anything like that, but when I'm preaching, or when I'm teaching, I can feel the connection, the draw from someone with, um, in the audience. And I feel that my preaching is in vain if I can't feel that because I'm definitely on some other level. <laughs> 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 and for one, I mean, for me, preaching to me, you know, I if it doesn't hit me first, if it doesn't convict me first, then I'm not going to preach it. I'm not going to be mm-hmm. a self hypocrite. I'm not going to just get out there and be preaching about something and, and it hasn't checked me. Um, every time I preach, it has checked me first before I give yeah. it out. And I feel that that is, that should be the standard and that should be the standard for all preachers. Um, so I love it. Absolutely. And to your point to um, the suicide thing, I think that that is a very interesting um, concept. And I think that you're going to open up a, a, a door <laughs> <laughs> to a lot of people asking questions now. It's like, oh, so is suicide good for anything? And I think that I w- what I want to do, uh, and I'll probably bring you back on for this. Uh, I, I have an idea of uh, a, maybe a series or maybe a panel discussion where we just talk about suicide in the Bible and, you know, get some um, some clear understanding about it. Because as you said, it's not in there that you're going to go to hell if you commit suicide. It just says you, you go to hell for blaspheming against God. And it talks about a lot of these things. And we see how with, with Judas, how he committed suicide. Um, it doesn't say where he ended up being, but it always talks about the disgrace. Um, they always talk about how um, disgraceful he is. And so mm-hmm. I would love to like have that panel discussion where we find the truth and find um, 
find the right, you know, the right things to say um, so that we're not being hurtful. We're not telling people, hey, you're going to hell. <laughs> you're going to hell in a handbasket. And, um, and, and different things like that because we want to be, um, we want to be um, human. We want to know that we want to, you know, have a heart for people mm-hmm. and, and help people understand exactly what the Bible is saying and be truthful about it. So I love it, man. I love it. I, I think that, yeah, I think that you're definitely going to open a, a, a case, <laughs> <laughs> but I love it. Cause I, I feel like we need to go down that path. We need to have these conversations. It's our pastors don't talk about it enough. Um, and it, and it, it never really comes up until you see stories in the news um, about people committing suicide or, um, maybe or or, or uh, recently, um, not as this recent, but within the uh, within a year, um, how several pastors have committed suicide, right. and people have talked about those things. And so it really doesn't. The conversation really doesn't come up until um, those events happen, and people talk about it then. But you know, you hear so many different opinions. There's like so much noise, and no one really knows um, the truth and what it, what the Bible really says. Because people can say what they want to say. We know what the Bible says about certain things, but it was like there's no hard stone truth, and it's like no one can really give a, a clear answer, especially when you read the comment section you just like god i'm just <laughs> right <laughs> by reading the comments so yeah we, we definitely gonna we're gonna touch that again because i feel like that's gonna be a really good one and that's gonna I, I feel like a lot of people will really benefit from that one for real um so awesome move on let's move along because let's keep chugging along <laughs> all right <laughs> all right so um what motivated you to pursue ministry uh and more in particular i really want to know what motivated you to um pursue um, the improv ministry within the gifts. Um, and I, I know you talked about it earlier with, um, you know, using it as a defense mechanism, but what, what prompted you to really go full tilt with it to just dive deeper into that aspect of say, okay, I want to use improv as a way to, to minister to people. Yeah. Um, for me, I saw improv as a way, uh, not only for comedic value, um, but it also has value in, in as a, teaching tool to mm-hmm. encourage people uh to find their self-esteem to find their self-worth to find their creativity that often they stifle once they get out of childhood uh it could be used as a way and i i teach a class called improv your witness which is designed to focus on on the luke 12 lesson where jesus is saying don't be worried about what you're going to say when you're pulled in front of the authorities which i think even though he's speaking specifically of the authorities, I think that it means don't be worried about what you're going to say whenever you're speaking the truth, because you, you should trust in the Holy Spirit. Right. And you should trust in God. And part of the reason we don't trust is that we're afraid of saying something stupid. Right. So if we use the, the fundamentals of improv to break through those walls, to teach you, hey, you've got something valuable to say. Because right. God breathed life into you. And he's not going to create something that's wasteful or ridiculous or stupid, mm-hmm. he's giving you value. And uh, Improv Your Witness helps you tap into that and focus on that Luke 12 philosophy of don't be afraid of what you're going to say. Just be ready and be prepared to let God lead you. Um, and what motivated me to get in is that improv is so much like what God uh, did. God walked onto a blank stage and spoke a universe into existence. Mm-hmm. On a very small scale, an improviser walks onto a blank stage and just speaks a world into existence. Because right. as soon as you're on a scene, whether it's a long form scene or it's a short form, like who's on it anyway, uh, you're walking onto this blank canvas and you're just saying, you're identifying who the person is on the scene with you. You're identifying where you're at. You're identifying why this moment's special. So God gave us that ability and that power with our words. And it's a power that we should really respect. Uh, to quote Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Yeah. Uh, so uh, with our words, we have so much power. We have power to build and create and encourage and so improv is just so valuable and god used my whole story to make me a a good improviser Um, most of my uh, adult life i used acting you know on stages as a way to um to find value Mm -hmm. and i would always improvise in the middle of scenes they would throw my actors off and they get (laughs) they get a little weary but i would love to break the fourth wall and bring people into the play 
Um, and also, I was a wrestler for eight years. Hmm. I uh, did pro wrestling uh, in West Virginia, Virginia, Tennessee, North Carolina. Hmm. And that's basically improv theater in the round in much more revealing clothes than I wear now. <laughs> <laughs> but exactly. uh, but you go out there, you're telling a story. Good guy, bad guy. This guy's trying to win. This guy's trying to cheat to win. Uh, and the crowd is feeding you what they want by yeah. their reactions. And it, you develop that ear of, do I give them what they want or do I give them the swerve now? Mm. And give them something that they don't know what they want. So that's what I do on the improv stage is go out there, I paint a picture with my words, I tell a story, and I listen for what the crowd's reacting to. And then kind of instinctively, I'll either give them the swerve that is more pleasing than what they expected, or I'll give them what they expected and be very enjoyable. And so because of all that, and because I truly want to use my gifts for God's glory, I just, it's a perfect fit because God is the most creative being ever. We're in his image, which means that we're just as creative on a smaller scale as he is. So being clean or being a Christian comedian, it's not limiting. It's actually freeing because when you're performing with other Christians, you don't have to worry about them uh, ruining your, your faith or your testimony by saying something out of line. And you also give them the assurance that you're not going to say something out of line that that hurts their ability to witness. Mm -hmm. So it's actually far more freeing than when I performed in secular theaters. Mm -hmm. Uh, Because when I came to Chicago, I performed in secular theaters where, and maybe it's an exaggeration, I was probably the only Christian for five blocks of that theater. But I, even in the most challenging circumstances, I kept my testimony. I was still able to avoid cursing. I was still able to avoid innuendo. But I was still able to build the scene with the pe- with these uh, with my scene partners, despite the fact that they might be going dirty or might be cursing or might be putting innuendo out. I was still able to be their partner, yeah. but also keep my testimony. And it frustrated several improv improv teachers. They're like, "Why don't you curse? Why don't you just go all the way? Why do you stop at that level?" I'm like, I don't have to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that. And that- that in and of itself is just telling because, you know, it means that you have standards, you know, I'm, I'm holding on to my morals. I'm holding on to what I believe. And, and so often in secular, in the secular world, um, cause Christians, we live in the secular world. There's no need mm-hmm. to try to discourage it. Uh, we go to work every day in the secular world, right? Uh, you know, we have to uphold that image. We have to uphold, um, who we are as Christians and be that representative uh, for Christ in the, in, in the secular world for the culture, because, there's so many there's so many instances where people will they they'll say they're Christian and then as soon as they get that opportunity to perform in a, in a secular setting you know they cuss them like a sailor mm-hmm. you know they you know they you see them on TV and they just about half naked and you're like what I just think you're Christian but yeah. you know we have you know, <laughs> you know we have to um, maintain that image at all costs you know whether if it costs us to uh, you know, key roles, if it costs us, you know, fame or anything like that, you know, we have to still be, you know, Christians, we have to still be light in this dark world, um, no matter what we do. So I love it. I applaud you for that. Um, One of the things I was going to say is like, if my son was here, you know, and he heard that you was a pro wrestler, I'm pretty sure he would go crazy because he (laughs) loves wrestling. His favorite wrestler right now is Braun Strowman. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> he loves wrestling. So, we um, actually took them, we took him to um, the Clash of Champions back in September because they came down here for, uh, to Charlotte for um, the pay per view event. And man, that was just an awesome experience. I had never been to a, um, a wrestling event ever. And mm-hmm. just being a part of the crowd, we had a heckler behind us. He was just crazy, getting on somebody's nerves. <laughs> And it was a sun. I mean, I was in the moment. It was like it was kind of cool, you know. Like, I mean, of course, the kids there. And he's saying some off the wall stuff. And like, man, I got kids. But, <laughs> <laughs> but at the same time, I was like, well, we are at a wrestling event, and stuff like this happens. And I mean, he's clearly drunk, but at the same time, it was like, you know, hey, it's pretty cool. It was like, you know, we we see people in their natural element, and we, you know, I've never been in that environment, and it was just so cool to see the wrestlers and. Hear the theme music in real time, and go crazy. 
So yeah, it's cool. It's cool. And I think yeah. there's a, a, a perfect semblance um, with what you're doing uh, with the improv thing and um, drawing on your experience as a pro wrestler um, and learning how to draw or learning how to navigate with the crowds. A lot of that kind of comes with, with ministry too, because you, you feed off of people and preachers don't really like to say this or, pre- or admit this, but you do free feed off of the crowd, you mm-hmm. feed off, of the, off of the crowd's reaction. Um, if they with you, they with you. If they not, then, you know, Hey, <laughs> you know, you feed off of that, you know? Yeah. Um, I, I find it funny with this season that we're in, a lot of preachers were struggling with um, preaching in an empty church because it was like, man, there's nobody here. I can't, <laughs> I can't take right. my neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's nobody sitting there in the front row going, mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Amen. Right. Come on. Right. So they had to really improvise and make, make that stuff up. Like, oh, well, I got to, you know, I got to really, you know, feed off of the Holy Spirit, feed mm-hmm. off of what God is really saying. So I really feel, I feel like, you know, in ministry, we have that, that semblance. And I feel like we have that, um, that commonality that people don't really want to admit. So, yeah. All right, so um, one of the, um, if, okay. if I could, one of the, uh, the most valuable things that I'm doing with improv is uh, about two years ago, I gave my testimony at this fundraiser. I felt like God was telling me, give your testimony. Mm-hmm. And I thought it was because there was somebody in the crowd that was contemplating suicide and he wanted me to speak to that person. So I gave my testimony and after I got off stage, not really sure why God wanted me to, but I was being obedient. Uh, this lady that runs an organization that works with women who have survived sex trafficking came up. Wow. And she said, I would love for you to teach our ladies improv as a way to build their communication. I'll let them have some fun and you know, maybe work on their self-esteem a little bit. So for the last two years, once a month, I go to this organization and I work with these ladies who have survived sex trafficking and, and are now basically rebuilding their lives. And for an hour uh, a month, I'm able to um, help work on their communication skills, work on their listening skills, uh, work on their self-esteem, tap into that creativity that they've lost. Uh, And if none of that happens, at least for that hour, they're able to laugh like little girls uh, without a care in the world. And it's, it's so beautiful and such a blessing to come in and see one of them, uh, maybe walk in, with that countenance, like they're carrying the burdens of the world and they just don't want to be messed with. Mm. And then they have to participate because it's part of the program you participate. So they get up in the circle, the shoulders are forward, the scowl is there. And, you know, in any other situation, I wouldn't mess with them at all. Right. But here it's improv. I got to make you laugh. So we start doing some warm up games. And in five minutes, you literally see it crumble off. Yeah. The shoulders raise up. The, the neck straightens out and you just see them laugh and enjoy being with people. And also the, the thing that is really beautiful is they're having fun in a healthy way with a man. Mm, right. Because you know, coming from where they've come from, healthy male relationships are almost yes. non-existent. Right. And that, that blessing of being able to do that and serve there, it's made, everything that I've been doing, everything I've been, been pursuing worth it because I know that at least for an hour a month, they're back to a normal because they're laughing without a care and they've forgotten their history for right. that hour. And that's what, I mean, that's what it's all about. I think yeah. that that is great work because man, I, I just, I have a daughter. So I think about, you know, what would happen if, if anything were to happen to her, Mm-hmm. And God forbid, I don't even have any wood to knock on, but God forbid, like, if that happened to, you know, turn out to be her life, I just don't know what I would do. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I, I applaud anyone that does work in the sex trafficking, uh, with the sex trafficking business or with the ministry, um, per se, not the business, because the business is just nasty. But yeah, right. with, <laughs> with the ministry and just, you know, by helping these young ladies um, to find some sense of normalcy. Um, the point that you made that was poignant was that, you know, they see a healthy relationship with the man. Um, they see someone who's not trying to get with them, not trying to do anything for a favor, you know, that just, you know, really genuinely cares about them and just wants to see their well-being. Um, 
that's powerful and that speaks in and of itself and i applaud you for that because you know you're using your gifts you know in a unique way to really impact people um that that goes beyond the four walls of the church you know not too many people can say hey i i, I ministered to or worked with some sex trafficking or sex traffic um victims and you know was able to you know break down those walls and actually see them, you know, open up and become vulnerable in that moment to where they're able to share um, in that moment. And you're like, it's not as far and few between that you find people that can do that. And so that's, that's pretty awesome. That's really awesome. I, I should ask you that earlier. <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know if I'd mentioned that before. So I, I really, I like being to be able to share it because, you know, it's not about me. It's not like, oh, Dave Ebert is out here doing this great thing. It's that God is using my story, my testimony, my experiences. Because had I not shared my testimony, had I not been uh, obedient, then I wouldn't have had this opportunity. Right. So God's using my obedience as a way to to use me to help improve the lives of others. And you know, it, it's been so hard these last months because of the quarantine and the lockdowns that I haven't been able to do this in person because as great as technology is, nothing substitutes the fellowship of being in the same room and having a conversation and being able to look eye to eye uh, with these ladies and, and just do my best just to share Christ's love because my job is not there to preach. My job is there to uh, all these skill building, but also to show love. Yes. And it's through that love that ministers to their hearts that opens the door for the rest of the program to feed in and, and bring them closer to the Lord. Yes. And that's beautiful. It's, it reminds me a little bit of um, Lecrae. I, I'm sure you know who Lecrae is, right? Oh yeah. Yeah. It, it's funny because like he, um, he used to go to strip clubs and, and he would, you know, hand out his music at strip clubs. And people were like, why are you going to the strip club? Like, right, you know, right. Mary, you know, you don't even get no strip club. He was like, you know, those are souls too. Those are lost souls. They need the word. Um, and it's like, I, I, I hate to say it's like an untapped, <laughs> an untapped will, <laughs> but I mean, it's, it's one of those things where people are scared to do, like people are scared to think outside of the box and do things in, for ministry, um, that right. are outside of the norm. And, you know, anyone that does anything that is not normal, um, uh, for the purpose of ministry, you know, it's always, um, it, I don't say get a stamp of approval from me, but it's like, it's always like, I mean, I, 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 I applaud stuff like that. And I'm like, right. Well, you know, you're thinking about um, new innovative ways to to do ministry that doesn't just require you, you know, standing up uh, behind the pulpit to preach, you know, and, and to and to have that ministry. That is great and awesome. But, you know, it's also um, more impactful when you're able to take that same ministry um, and use it in a different way outside of the pulpit and impact people's lives. Yeah. So. And here's a, a word of warning to anybody that heard that story about Lecrae. Be very strong in your faith and resistance of temptation right. before you even consider that kind of a ministry, especially as a man, because uh, it, I could just imagine, yeah, honey, I, I'm going to go witness to the women at the strip club. <laughs> I, uh, no, it, it, you have to be strong in your faith and you know that you can and... divert your eyes when you need to. So right. <laughs> don't go into a ministry that has a lot of temptation around unless you are rooted strong. Right. Um, exactly. That's, that's key. That is key because you don't want to be, you don't want to be the one that's always at the strip club. You inside the strip club trying to minister to people with, with everything in your face. And that's just not, that's just not what God has called us to do. You know? <laughs> yeah. Just because the singles you're throwing say in God, we trust that's not witnessing. <laughs> it's not the same. <laughs> It's not the same as the Bible track, you know, and God, right. God's been on the dollar bill. It's not the same as the Bible track. So, but, <laughs> I love it. I love it. But yeah, man, it, that, that's awesome. And um, man, I, we we went over a little bit, but I, I I appreciate this time, man. I really do. Um, we you dropped a lot of gems. You you really, um, I love your testimony. Um, I you. love everything about what you're doing. Um, and I love the ministry that God has birthed in you. Um, I saw your wife came in a little bit and I saw, um, I did a little bit of, a little bit of research and I saw the picture that you had, you guys had when you got married and she's like dragging you on the ground. And I thought that was so awesome. 
<laughs> so, I mean, you guys have such a beautiful um, marriage, and it seems to be a beautiful marriage. Um, and you guys have a beautiful family. Um, and I'm praying for you, praying you. for um, your ministry, pray that God continue to uh, give you you know, innovative ways to minister to people and to um, help people and just continue to flourish. You know, I think that what you're doing, you know, it, it, it's impactful. Uh, if anyone tells you different, you know, you just tell them that they're a lie because, you know, you have something that is powerful, that is legit helping people. Um, I mean, you're, you're helping sex trafficking victims. <laughs> like, it, it doesn't get any better than that. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're, you're using your gifts to bring smiles to people's face. Um, you're using your gifts for good and not, you know, to, to, to do whatever you want in the secular world. And that's awesome. That's really awesome. I love it. I love you. I love what you're doing. And I've said that a million times, but I really do. I really do think it's dope. I do. I really do. I wish I would have thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, last question, and I'll, I'll let you go because I know your wife probably wants you, all of you. And I'll... <laughs> <laughs> and I'm just interrupting everything. But um, so how can um, how can people find you, connect with you and your ministry and everything that you're doing? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, my email address is dave at giftsforglory.com. That's gifts, the number four, glory.com. And if you're somebody, again, that's struggling with suicidal thoughts or depression, that's wide open for you. If you uh, want to uh, find out about our podcast, it's uh, giftsforglory.com. Or if you want to find out about the uh, improv uh, ministry team, uh, just look up uh, Wellverse Comedy. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram, uh, and we'd love to connect with you if you're interested in having a virtual show for your small group or whatever. We can do that. Uh, if you're wanting to have the improv your witness uh, class held at your church or or wherever or your small group, we'd love to come out and. Um, I, I've got days off. I can leave Chicago to come visit if if somebody wants. Uh, especially now, with, where Chicago and Illinois is still kind of semi open, semi closed. I know yeah. there's some other states that are wide open now. So I would love to escape. <laughs> <laughs> we would all love to escape. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.